You know, we often go through times where we have expectations for what's going to happen in our lives. And when those expectations are not met, it can throw our life into a tailspin. Well, in today's video, I'm going to talk to you about some attitudes that we need to have in order to not just get through some of these tough times, but how to thrive. Hello everybody, this is Pastor Lyle and welcome to Daily Renewal. If this is your first time tuning in with us, just want to welcome you and encourage you uh, to become a subscriber to our channel. It also helps us a lot if, uh, if you're getting value out of our content, if you like and share these videos with as many people as you think that they will help. We have over 200 episodes of Daily Renewal that are all designed to help you in your Christian walk. You ever found yourself in a position where you feel like maybe you've been limited uh, in uh, carrying out the things that God has called you to do? You know, recently uh, I was spending some time with the Lord in prayer, and uh, where I am currently in Canada, uh, we have had the churches totally shut down, and for me, a pastor of uh, over 20 years, you know, I being in a position where you can't go to your church on Sunday and preach to people, uh, you know, there's been a lot of limitations all, all around the world uh, in with uh, pastors being able to preach to actual congregations. And, uh, you know, as I was in my prayer time, I began asking the Lord, you know, what am I, you know, what's, what's next, Lord? You know, what's next for the church? Because I believe that there's a huge shift that's happening with the church, uh, not just in North America, but all around the world. Uh, I don't believe things are going to get back to the way that they used to be. Because frankly, uh, the way things used to be, I think really needed a change and really needed a shake up. And so I was spending some time with the Lord. And I said, Lord, you know, how am I supposed to preach? How am I supposed to do the things that I believe that you have created me to do? I seem like everything is so, or it seems like everything's so limited. And then he reminded me that uh, Apostle Paul, who was responsible for writing most of the New Testament, actually wrote uh, uh, four of what we call the epistles. Uh, that he wrote four of them while he was in prison. Now, there was a couple times where Paul was in prison, and as I began to uh, just seek the Lord in this, he began to just show me what our attitude should be, or what, what Paul's attitude was, first of all, when he was in prison. You know, as I look at what I'm currently going through, and I know there's a lot of other people that are going through similar situations where, uh, you know, maybe uh, some of the expectations you had about how things were going to unfold in your ministry or your life, they've been challenged. Well, in my particular situation, and many others, you know, the fact that uh, as a pastor, I can't physically go and do what uh, most pastors think they're called to do. I can't go to a local church and actually preach to physical people. Uh, Paul was in this situation as well. He was in a place multiple times where he found himself in prison. And, and worse than what I'm in, many times when he was in prison, there was no guarantee that he was getting out. And so I want to take a look at one of the stories today uh, of a situation when he was put in prison. Now, he ended up getting out of this particular one. The Lord delivered him, out, delivered him out of it. But we're going to continue on this theme of what our attitude needs to be when we are in the place when it looks like, in the natural, there is no hope. So today I want to start with a story uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 16. And we see that Paul and Silas, they go into this city and this girl begins to follow them, and she has a spirit of divination. She begins to proclaim that these guys are men of God, and you should listen to them. But it was under a wrong spirit. And after following them for a few days, Paul finally turns, and, and he casts this spirit of divination out of this girl. Well, the problem with that is, is the people that were her handlers after this happened, you know, they got upset because that was their way of making money. So they bring Paul, they drag Paul and Silas uh, to this place and they, they start getting people upset with them. And it ends up 
that Paul and Silas find themselves in, uh, in the inner prison. And so here they are, they're in this place where they don't know what's going to happen to them. You know, they just had an angry mob that wanted them killed, and now they find themselves in prison. And so we pick up the story in verse 25 of chapter 16 of the book of Acts, and it says this. It says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do, not harm, uh, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Now, as I look at this story, you know, how many times have you and I find, found ourselves in situations that were tough and that just it didn't look like things were going to go our way? And our response was that we began singing and, and uh, singing hymns and praying to God. Well, you know, uh, early on in my Christian walk, uh, I actually experienced, I remember the first time I experienced somebody that really had a relationship with Jesus to the point where when the going got tough, this is what they actually did. You know, this is a really good sign of, some, uh, of somebody who's had a real transformation in their life. Somebody who is able to see through a situation in the natural and focus on God to the point where they've really uh, put their trust in Him uh, so that they would uh, see themselves doing something like this, turning to Him rather than looking at their situation. Now, as we look at this, the, the idea of them at midnight being in prison and the fact that they were singing and, uh, and praying... Uh, that we see the first thing that, that really caught me off guard when I saw this is the fact that while they were doing this, they had a bunch of people around them. Uh, and we can assume that most of, if not all the people around them, were people that were suffering, that people that were going through the exact same circumstances as them, and yet uh, they were not in the position where they had enough peace to be able to, uh, to, to sing to God and pray. And you know, for us, we have to understand that as we go through tough circumstances, for those of us that call ourselves Christians, we have a lot of people that uh, are observing Christianity right now. And, you know, I, I can say from my own experience, there was lots of times before I was a Christian that I observed Christians, and I have to say that I had some really negative experiences. I found, uh, found often that Christians were really willing to uh, tell me that I needed to change the way I thought, and to change the way I need to believe, and I needed to come to church, and all these things. But when it came right down to it, there was a part of me that says, that said, you know, why? What, like, what, what's, what's, what's really so bad? I mean, I knew that my life wasn't perfect, but I never really saw that there was much difference uh, between the people that I was looking at that were going to church and, and myself. You know, I saw that a lot of them, they failed in a lot of the ways that I failed. Uh, and, I, and I guess there was nothing that really stood out to me. But it wasn't until later on that uh, God began to put people in my path that I really felt uh, I was challenged in looking at, at my own belief system, looking at my own life, challenged by people that I, I looked at. And when I saw, uh, I, I saw in them something that I really desired, that in turn made me, uh, made me want to look and say, okay, 
you know, what do they have that I don't have? And it wasn't religion I, uh, that I was seeing. It was a true relationship with Jesus. And that's why it's really important, you know, as I do daily renewal, one of the things that we really focus on is the fact that, you know, if we do have a, a real relationship with Jesus Christ, there is going to be a transformation that happens in our life. And this is something that as we look at the example of Paul and Silas here, we need to know that just as they were in a situation that looked impossible, it looked like, you know, it was a really bad situation. And the prisons in that time, I'm going to tell you, that the prisons in that time were not like the prisons in our day. I mean, these were rat-infested places. You know, often, uh, you didn't even eat unless somebody you knew brought you food. I mean, there are lots of things about these prisons that were not comfortable. And yet these two guys were at such a place in their walk with God that it seemingly didn't really bother them. You know, maybe they did understand that, that there was people around here. And, I, I, and I, I, I probably lean to the fact that they understood that this was an opportunity for them uh, to, to spend this time, yeah, relating with God, but also to be an example to those that were around them. And as they sat in this prison, Yes, they openly praised God, they sang to the Lord, and they openly prayed. And I guarantee you, these were not prayers of, of oh Lord, how come you've done this to me? No, they were just simple prayers of building relationship and seeking the Lord and seeking His will on what to do, probably even praying for a lot of the people that were in this prison at the time, because they had a captive audience, as we see here. And as we move on with talking about today's subject, I just want to encourage you to always remember, as you go through what may look like your impossible situation right now, always keep in mind that there is people around you that are observing you. And it's vital that we continue to get close to the Lord in our own relationship so that it can bring hope to those who truly have no hope. If we do not have Jesus Christ, you know, the author and finisher of our faith, the God of, of heaven above, but also the one uh, who's, who's looking at all situations in, in, all, uh, in every man's life, in, 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 including those who don't know, uh, who have not confessed Jesus yet. He looks at all of us. And for those who, who have no hope, we have to be in a position where we understand that if we can show others that there is hope when we have our lives entrusted in Jesus, then they too maybe will make a decision that can transform their life not only here on earth, but their life in eternity. Uh, so let's take a look at this. It says here that they were singing, and then right as they were singing, they, they weren't expecting this to happen. They didn't know this was going to happen. But God supernaturally does something. Uh, suddenly there's an earthquake that can't be described as, as being something done by Paul and Silas. It's not like their singing was so loud that it all, all of a sudden caused an earthquake. No, a supernatural event occurred. And this is important as well because we need to understand that we have a God that can truly move mountains on our behalf. You know, there is nothing in this world that God hasn't already seen. There isn't a situation that can happen that, 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 that God in heaven is looking at and, and catches him by surprise. We have to know that God can truly uh, do anything in order to get us out of our circumstances. Now, from here, I want to talk about three attitudes that uh, Paul and Silas had while they were in prison. And this is important because as we're going through our stuff, if we just get focused on the things that are going on around us, just get focused on our own survival, we're liable to miss out on a lot of the things that God has planned for us. So the first thing that I want to point out here that we need to be aware of when we're going through circumstances that are beyond our control, circumstances that don't make sense, and we see here with Paul and Silas, the first thing that, that we want to touch on today is they didn't have a focus on themselves or their situation. All of their focus was on the Lord. You know, we see here. 
They were spending time praying. They were spending time, you know, singing songs to God. And you know, when we, when we, uh, when our church was able to to actually meet together, one of the things that that uh, I really enjoy, and I remember that when I first started coming to church, the thing that didn't make any sense to me in the natural, but it made a huge difference in my life. You know, I was a guy who I really liked music. I was a music connoisseur. I had all these different bands that I listened to, and I, I was up to date on all the latest trends. And, and you know, when I went to church, we would sing these songs that honestly, I thought to myself many times, I thought, you know what? Uh, you know, before I came to church, I would be embarrassed if I sang any of these songs. You know, they didn't have any real cool beat to them, and, and they didn't have any, like, loud guitar. And, 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 but I'm going to tell you what happened, is there were songs that when I sang them, they did something on the inside of me. There were songs that were helping me connect to God. You know, often they were songs that were that were uh, exclaiming how grateful I was to Him. Uh, songs about His greatness. Songs about how much I care about Him. Songs that relayed how much I knew He cared about me. They were songs that 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 were that were bringing a connection to to myself and God. And it was no longer about the beat. It was no longer about the style of music. And we have to understand that when, when they were in prison, they were singing songs that were truly bringing a connection. It wasn't just some uh, something that was making them feel good. And you know, this is one thing that I, I think that I want to just touch on for a moment. You know, when I hear a lot of people, you know, like that are in a similar situation to me where they're not able to go to a, a local church, you, you know, uh, I've heard a lot of people say, you know what, I miss church or... You know, because church, even if you uh, you are in situations where you can have maybe small groups of people, social distance, and all the different things you got to do now, there's a lot of people say, well, you know, it's not the same as it used to be. And, you know, <clears throat> a lot of times when I look at uh, the direction that the church was going, a lot of it is uh, was getting involved in what I will call soulish worship. Uh, you know, worship that was, you know, not really changing you spiritually, but was uh, affecting your mind, affecting your will, and affecting your emotions. That's what the soul is. The soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. And, you know, music, whether it's uh, what we call, you know, one Christian music, you know, worship music, whatever it is, um, you know, as much as we uh, can see that there's something that God uses that for, uh, we can also look outside of Christianity and understand it. And all you got to do is look back through your life at different times where in your life that you were going through things, and you'll hear maybe a song playing on the radio that'll bring you back right to that time period, maybe when you were going through certain things. You know, it doesn't have to be Christian music to all of a sudden do something that triggers your soul. And, you know, when I talk about the idea of soulish music in church, you know, I think that often we need to be very careful that we don't just get into this idea of uh, of getting uh, having music that just triggers things and makes us feel good. True worship and, and, and true praise needs to be the type of music that really helps you connect with God spiritually. And when we are connecting with God spiritually, true worship uh, and true praise... Uh, you know, true music that we should be singing to God like they were singing here is the type of music that when it's done properly will continue the process of transformation in your life. That's why a lot of the songs that we sing uh, or all the songs need to be based in uh, scripture. You know, are they based in truth? You might say, well, you know, how do you know that, Pastor Lyle? Well, this is something that, uh, you know, as a pastor, I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of times uh, over my years of pastoring where I've actually stopped and I had a really good worship leader, you know, when the church was open, a guy that I've been, uh, has been with me for years. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we did is we would look at songs and, and often some of the, the hottest songs in Christian circles, if you were to really look at them and put them up to the lens of the Bible, we found that there was a lot of songs that we sang in church that weren't even biblical. But they made us feel good, uh, or or they were popular. But you know, for us, when it comes to the idea of singing praises to God, the kind of of songs that are really going to 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 make a difference when we're in a time like Paul and Silas were here, we've got to be at the place where we sing songs that really are connecting to God uh, in in spirit and in truth. And again, 
How do we know that, that they are based in truth? Because the Bible is the, the true word of God. So, uh, you know, as I say that, I also want to encourage you in this. You know, there was probably songs that they sang that they had sung many times before. But I know myself, and, and uh, this is being a little bit vulnerable, but I'm going to tell you that some of the best worship songs I've ever sang were songs that I was sitting uh, sitting in my car and I was just pouring out my heart to the Lord in some form of music. And I could tell you there'll never be a top 10 on anybody's list. But I know that I, as I sat in my car, as I sat in my chair, you know, just spending time with the Lord, just singing to God a song about Him, about how much you care about Him, about how much you, you appreciate Him. You know, they don't have to be the, the most famous songs on the planet. What God is looking for is a song from your heart that really uh, has everything to do with uh, your relationship with Him. Now, I could go further on that, but uh, I just want to encourage you. Uh, don't get caught up on just how things uh, feel or, or what's popular. We have to remember that if we're going to see real work in our lives in, 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 uh, to do with real transformation in our life, singing praises to God, singing songs, spiritual hymns, you know, these kind of things that were, were being done in tough times, you know, making the effort to do this, to reach out to God when it's not comfortable, these are things that make a huge difference in our lives. And that coincides also with the idea of prayer. Prayer and singing uh, or worshiping God are both, uh, both have to do with, with uh, communication with the Lord. So we see here the first thing, uh, you know, we need to focus on God. They were focusing on God regardless of what anybody else thought around them. But I have to also look at the idea of when they were in this prison, Knowing the way that Paul was, I guarantee that as much as his focus was on God, there was something within Paul and, and possibly and probably Silas as well, because Paul was a mentor to this, uh, this young man, Silas. I th have to also think that with everything that Paul did, he was also looking at an opportunity to focus on on those that were around him that pro probably, potentially, didn't know Jesus. And, and so the idea of, of Paul being in this situation, it comes down to uh, what Jesus talked about being uh, what all the law and the commandments hang on. And it was the fact, and we see this in uh, particularly in Matthew 22, you know, he was, uh, he was asked, Jesus was asked, you know, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded in basically saying, you know, the, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second commandment is, un, is like unto it is love your neighbor as yourself. Now for all of us, you know, when we see, when he talks about all the law and the commandments hanging on these two things, we should be living a lifestyle that no matter how things are going around us, we have to have God as our focus, but also we have to keep in mind that we are here on this earth to bring the gospel message to those who don't know it, to those who don't know Jesus. You know, as, as a lot of people might say, well, you know, what I'm about to say next, well, that sounds pretty tunnel vision. You know, there's a lot of people say, oh, there's many ways to God. Well, according to Jesus, there is only one way, and it's through him. And, and so for me as a believer, I, I'm not going to get in a lot of arguments with people about whether Christianity is the right religion or not. You know, if, if somebody wants to argue about those things, you know, I'll, I'll probably find somebody else who, who really uh, is, whose God's prepared their heart to be able to, uh, uh, to want to hear the message. And, you know, that's a whole message in itself. But, you know, I'm always looking for people that, you know, if they want to hear the message about why my life is hopefully, uh, you know, in, the, in a steady state of transformation, why my life is maybe different. You know, and I'm just like everybody else. You know, I'm in the process. There's things in my life that God is ironing out just like everybody else. But, you know, I know that my life has been transformed in a, in a major way compared to the way I used to be. And that doesn't make me any better than anyone else. And, you know, being a Christian, it doesn't make us better than anyone else. But it gives us hope that, that we have to understand. The Bible is very clear. Hope that we have that others don't have yet. 
And as I approach, you know, uh, all the situations in life, I'm always looking for opportunities to continue in my walk with God, but also opportunities to bring the hope of the gospel to those who do not have that hope yet. And as Paul and Silas stood in, or sat probably in stocks in this prison, in fact, they were, uh, you know, uh, th th we have to see that their focus wasn't on themselves, wasn't on their situation, but it was easy to see that their focus was on God and their focus was on other people. Now, the second thing that I want to talk to you about, and this is, this is very tough for all of us, you know, and when we look at the life of the disciples, they were no different than us. You know, they, they went into this relationship with Jesus with real preconceived ideas about how things were going to go. And, you know, for all of us, you know, we have ideas about, again, the things that God's called us to do, you know, whether, you know, for myself, you know, being a pastor, you know, what's God going to do with my church? What's God going to do with my people, my life? Uh, you know, the people I pastor, uh, you know, for you, maybe, you know, you have preconceived ideas about how God's going to do things in your business and your family, your life. You know, we often come into this thing with preconceived ideas. And very often what happens is, is when some of these ideas are challenged, you know, it's at that point that we kind of look and go, God, you know, what's going on here? And it can create a lot of confusion. And it's at that point that we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to put God's plan against uh, or ahead of our plan, or are we going to falter uh, when it comes down to us not, not seeing our way uh, come to pass with things? And, you know, I want to talk about a, a specific situation where Paul, he was struggling. There was some th things coming at him. And this particular portion is what's often referred to as Paul's thorn in the flesh. And there's a lot of different ideas as to what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. But ultimately, it was a messenger sent by Satan. And we'll read that here uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, starting in uh, verse 7. Paul, or Paul says this, uh, to the church in Corinth, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I'll rather both boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, there's a lot in this right here. But what I want to point out today is the fact that there was something going on in Paul's life that he was pleading with the Lord to change. And, and God didn't change it. In fact, God turned that around and said, Look, Paul, you got to understand that as a result of this thing that I have allowed. Now, notice, there was a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him. Now, we know that, that when temptation comes, tempt, God is never the one that tempts us. But we have to see here that Satan was given a, a, an amount of opportunity to, uh, to do something in Paul's life. And rather than, than come against Satan, uh, Jesus said to Paul, Look, what you need to do is you need to trust me. And he says... He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, on Daily Renewal, we've often talked about this idea of grace. Now, grace is something that we cannot earn. It's the unmerited favor of God. But it's more than that. Grace, I often refer to it as the power of God that enables you to do what you cannot do in your own strength. And so when Jesus says here that my grace is sufficient, what he's saying to Paul here is, look, you need to get to the point where you're not relying on yourself. 
And you, you need to, because in our own strength, we are weak. We're not going to be able to do what we need to do in order to accomplish the things that God wants us to accomplish. And often, you know, again, the things God wants us to accomplish, if we just start doing things in our own strength, often what happens is we start to go towards goals that are our own goals. But when we offer ourselves up, to the plan that God has for our lives and we rely upon his grace, his power that enables us to do what we cannot do in our own strength, then what happens is he begins to lead us into the things that he has for us. But in order for us to be able to operate in his grace, we have to give up our own strength and we have to become what's talked about in Matthew 18. And you can look at this up in uh, Matthew 18 verses 1 to 4, uh, Jesus is talking, they're asking, you know, who's the greatest among us? And Jesus talks about the fact that if you're going to be the greatest, the greatest is the one who humbles himself like a child. And, and oh, there's so much in that. See, for, for a child, when we look at a child uh, and his dependence upon his mom and dad, you know, a small child, a child humbles himself and becomes totally dependent. A child is really helpless. I mean, as they get older, they learn how to be self-sufficient, and a, parent, a good parent will teach them that. But a young child is somebody who looks at, you know, I, I look, think back when I was a kid. You know, I used to think my dad could do absolutely anything. You know, if I needed anything, all I'd have to do is ask my mom and dad because I trusted them to be the one that had all the power, all the strength, that they could do anything. Well, this is the same way that we need to approach God. And especially, we need to approach God with situations that in our own mind don't make sense. Situations that, that don't make sense in regards to our future. Don't make sense in regards to our business, our ministry. You know, all these things that, that seem to come at us that, bring, that, that seemingly are confusing are not confusing when we come to understand that we are a child of God and as a child of God, I can depend on Him to empower me to get through and get to any destination that He's desired me to get to. There's no weapon that the enemy has formed against me that will prosper, that will, that will keep me get, from getting to the destination that God is trying to get me to. You know, and when I look at, at Romans 8, 28, one of my favorite scriptures that I enjoy quoting, you know, we have to understand that all things, all things do work toward good for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Are you one of the ones called according to his purpose? Well, if you've, uh, if you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ, you believe on him, you trust in, rely upon, and, and adhere to Jesus, he's, he, you know, he's, he's your life, you give your life to him, then you know what? It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. There's something that God is potentially processing in your life uh, to, to refine you so that you can be more like him. And it also is helping in getting you to the place that God has desired to get you to. And it may not look anything like your pre preconceived idea, but the great part about it is where he's trying to get you is the true destination to where you are supposed to be. So we see here, as, as we look at Paul and Silas, they were in a situation that wasn't going as they had planned. And we see that the, the way that they handled it, number one, they didn't focus on themselves or their situation. Instead, they made their focus on God and on carrying out the plan of God. In other words, they focused on God and they focused on people. And the, the second thing that we see here is they humbled themselves uh, to, uh, to accept God's plan. Regardless of what their plan was, they were willing to humble themselves and say, you know what, God, as much as we not, may not understand this, we know and we trust that you know what you're doing. So that brings me to my third point today. And, uh, and as I, I look at this, you know, I myself, have, as I've mentioned earlier, I found myself in a position uh, you know, months ago where as a pastor of a church for many years, you know, preaching to people every week and, and uh, you know, being used to hearing people say amen and, and being used to actually having physical contact. Well, you know, right now, 
uh, you know, again, I'm in a position where our churches are totally shut down. We can't meet in any way, shape, or form. And there's people, other people, pastors, uh, you know, in Canada, uh, 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 or even in, uh, around the world, that are limited on how they can actually meet. You know, church isn't the same as it used to be. Uh, or some that have been shut down totally, like myself. And it was at that time uh, that I began to just seek the Lord. And, you know, I wonder, you know, Lord, what? how do I continue doing what I'm called to do because I've always looked at it as being a pastor of a church and I had preconceived ideas about that. And it was at that time that, that, uh, that the Lord started to remind me, look at what you have. You know, we have to remember that all of us have been gi given giftings and callings. And actually, let's go to Romans 12. Romans 12, Paul says this, uh, starting in verse 3. He says, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to, to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all, uh, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. Uh, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, uh, he who leads with diligence, uh, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now basically what this is saying is, and you could go on about different giftings, every one of us has been given giftings. And that being the case, it doesn't matter what your circumstance is, we have to count on the fact that number one, we've all been given giftings to do something for the kingdom. And number two, if, the, if we've been given, given a gift, then we have to understand that that is something that God has given us and we just have to look and, and or observe on how that gifting can function. So let me let me uh, backtrack a little bit, and, and I've said all that to say this. For myself, just because I don't have a congregation, I still have the gift. And my responsibility with that gift is to say, okay, well, that's my gift. How does that gift work in this current situation? And, you know, so when I look at, at what I'm doing right now, I don't have the opportunity to physically meet and, and with, a, with a physical church and be able to do what God has gifted me to do. But I do have the opportunity to do what I've been gifted to do, and that's preach the gospel and teach from the Bible. I still have the opportunity, opportunity to do that, and I'm doing it right now through the Internet. God has shown me a way to continue to see my gifting do what it was intended to do. Now, how does that work for you? I don't know what your ne what necessarily your gifting or your calling is, but I can guarantee you that no matter what your gifting or calling is, it is not being stunted by your situation. It may be that you need to get by yourself and ask the Lord, Lord, if you've gifted me, if you called me uh, to this certain, uh, certain ministry gift, this certain thing to be able to see the kingdom move forward, then now you need to focus on asking the Lord, Lord, how is it that I can, in this current situation, uh, let you use me to see that gifting come forth? And that gifting will always be uh, uh, for, the, for the seeing of the kingdom of God move forward. You know, we have to remember, the gifts and callings that we have, they're not for us. You know, God gifts, uh, gifts the body of Christ with something so that we can pour out and give that. You know, God uses us to, gift, uh, to, to give so, to somebody else to bless somebody else. The giftings are never made just for us to be able to uh, use for ourselves. And unfortunately, that's another topic for another day. A lot of people, you know, they can abuse their gift to the point where it becomes more about them than it is the kingdom. That, again, another message for another day. But we have to understand that if we've been gifted, and if you are a believer, then there is a gifting and a calling and possibly multiple giftings and callings upon your life. But now we have to be at the point where we're not going to be limited by situation. And when we take a look back at this story, 
uh, with Paul and Silas in the book of Acts, we can see here that, that uh, not only were they singing hymns to God and praying, uh, they found themselves in a, in a place where opportunity came. And that opportunity wasn't missed. And, and so how do we see that? Well, there was, a, there was something that happened where all of a sudden this earthquake breaks out and everyone's chains were loosed. But God had a plan for a family here to see their lives dramatically impacted. The jailer here in the story, the one who was willing to take his own life. Why? Because he, he thought that as a result of this situation, everybody was going to escape. And Paul and Silas had such an impact on everybody in this prison that nobody moved. And as a result, we see that many lives were changed. But in particular, we see that the life of this jailer was changed to the point where rather than uh, flee for their lives. I mean, a lot of times, you know, we, if people were in this situation as a Christian, they'd say, oh, praise God, he delivered us out. An earthquake happened. The, they we're no longer uh, in chains. Let's run for our lives. Jesus has given us our freedom. And, you know, a lot of times we can miss something greater that God has planned uh, by trying to save our own skin, uh, uh, in, in this situation, we see that Paul and Silas didn't miss their opportunity. They were so focused on God and His plan that they were be able to see. They uh, were able to see beyond themselves and see the life of this jailer and his entire family be transformed by uh, by uh, starting a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they took that opportunity. To, uh, to preach the gospel to them. And in verse 32, it says that they spoke the word of the Lord to them and his entire house was not just saved, but they were baptized even uh, on that day. So, so as we look at this, I want to encourage you today. We've got to keep our focus on God. We've got to keep our focus on other people. Don't focus on your circumstance. Allow God to unfold the plan, even if it doesn't look like it's what you think it should look like. And from there, we have to you know, actively be asking the Lord, you know, Lord, what have you given me to use? What is in my hand? If, you're, if you've got finances, what can you give to? If you're an encourager, how can you encourage? You know, as I was putting this message together, I thought... You know, I, I remember reading a story today that says that, that Twitter, for example, you know, there's a high percentage of people that go on Twitter and it's just nasty. Everybody's mad. Everybody's looking to get at somebody. You know, maybe for you, maybe you're on social media a lot. You know, maybe for you, you're an encourager. Uh, you know, look to put something encouraging every day on, on social media. You know, what is it that God has given you that can benefit the kingdom? And from there, remember, if he's given you something, if he's gifted you with something, that gift will not be shortchanged. It may be that you just have to find a different way. You need to ask the Lord who has given you the grace, the power of God to do what you cannot do in your own strength to see the will of God fulfilled uh, through what he has gifted you with. So I want to encourage you with that today. Whatever it is, find it. And, and you know, I, I remember a long time ago, I remember a preacher uh advice to me was, you know what, if you're not sure what to do, find a need and meet it. Because guarantee that God knows exactly what needs to be, uh, needs need to be met. And if you're in that situation to see that need, it very well could be that he's gifted you to be the one that he is going to use to provide that need or fulfill that need for someone else. Well, I hope you're encouraged by that, and I hope you got something out of that today. I just want to encourage you again, if you're not a subscriber to our channel, consider subscribing. And also, please, uh, if you're getting benefit out of our content, like and share these videos with as many people as you think that they will help. Well, I really enjoyed our session of daily renewal today. But until next time, God bless you, and have a great day.